So number four, Mitchell, I'm going to argue, first of all, this is almost identical to the car going around a corner question that we did last day in that I think the free body diagram for number four is going to be, hey, what are the forces? Gravity down, normal force up, and friction pushing this coin in a circle. Is that okay? And so it's going to be friction equals Fc. Is that all right? Friction is what times what? Mu times the normal force. I don't know the normal force. Oh, but look, 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 look. I know the force, same size. I'm going to get this. Mu mg equals m. And now I need to think, which expression for acceleration am I going to use? And what tells me is this. Now, what does RPM stand for? That means it goes around. 42 times in 60 seconds. That's a frequency. How do I change a frequency into a period? Now, I did say this on the first day of this unit, the first lesson. How are period and frequency related? Do you remember? Yeah, thank you. The period here has to be 60 over 42, which might be a nice decimal. Let me find out. I think it is. Oh no, it's going to be a repeating decimal. It's 1.4285. You know what? I'll just carry. I'll write 1.43, but I'll carry that on my calculator. And I'm going to use the 4 pi squared r over t squared. Conveniently, I don't need to know how much the coin weighs, which is good. What do they want me to find in number four? So to get the mu by itself, divide by g. It's going to be 4. Do I know the 4? Yeah. Pi squared, I know. Did they tell me the radius? Careful meters. Yeah. Right? Divided by 9.8 times the period that we just got squared. And that should be the coefficient of friction. Let's find out. 4 pi squared times 0.13 divided by bracket 9.8 times my previous answer squared. Yep, a point two five seven. Okay. I think what threw you off was this. Yes or no? Oh, just it's just like the car going around we, where we calculated. I think in the car though we calculated the safe speed. Here they told me the period, so I can calculate the coefficient of friction required. Is that all right? I would have expected anything. Anyways, any others? Really? I'm, I'm getting a sense you guys haven't done the homework, and that's going to come back and bite you. But I'm going to say then, do the homework and ask me questions from here tomorrow or Tuesday. Because, well, no others? Is that a, no, that was a hair number 93 quiz? Okay. Well, I have for you a take-home quiz. Lesson four, gravitation. We're going to change gears just a tiny bit, and at first it's going to seem a little unrelated, but we're going to tie it all together because we're going to find that actually circular motion, when we combine it with gravitation, allows us to do some nerdly cool things. This is the law of gravity, if you've ever heard that phrase. If you've heard the fake story about Sir Isaac Newton getting hit in the head by an apple and having this realization, this is the equation that he came up with. We think that story, by the way, is apocryphal, which means fake. We're pretty sure he, he did tell the story in his old age, but we think he told the story to make himself sound smarter and better than he was. He was a pretty big eagle maniac. Gravitation. Universal gravity. We have said that gravity is a force that exists between the Earth and masses on its surface, but actually, gravity is universal. Any two masses, any two masses in the universe exert an attractive force on each other. It's just a really, 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 really small force. You need a huge mass before you notice it. Example one. The diagram below shows two masses, big M, think planet, and little m, think moon or satellite. 
Big M is the greater mass. Compare the gravity forces on the two masses. Option A. The force exerted by M is greater. Option B. The force exerted by little m is greater. Option C. The forces are the same. And convince me. Once again, we're going to vote. Once again, how high you hold your hand up is how sure you are of the answer. Once again, if you choose not to vote and I catch you, I will damage your self-esteem. So we have a planet, we have a moon, or a planet, a satellite. Is the force by the planet greater? A. Got two, three, four, five. Who says the force exerted by the little satellite is greater? No one. Who says they're the same? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, seventeen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Who's a coward? You didn't vote at all. You voted, oh, you voted coward? Oh, yeah, I, I know. Believe me, I saw certain people look around at everybody, and once more people put their hands up with about a one-second delay, their hand went up. I know these things. I just get more upset with people that can't even have an opinion. All right, convince me that you're right or someone else is wrong. Emily. You're right. Why? So Emily says the forces have to be the same and stable because if one was bigger, it wouldn't be an orbit. Or we wouldn't have a stable orbit. I'm going to even go more basic than that. What was Newton's third law? Forces come in. If object M applies a force on object little m, object little m has to apply exactly the same force opposite direction on object big M. Really? The moon tugs on the Earth? Yeah, we call it tides. In fact, it, it moves the Earth so much that the water around the Earth sloshes back and forth. That's what tides are. Okay. Cavendish, a scientist who came after Newton and others since him, have designed very ingenious experiments to measure this small force of attraction. You see, the problem is we can certainly measure what the Earth does, but to try and replicate that in a lab with masses that you can fit into a room, the gravitational force of attraction between two masses is extraordinarily small. It's like eight decimal points small. How the heck do you measure that? And especially 100 and 150 years ago with the instrumentation that they had, they came up with some very ingenious experiments. I'll be talking about one of them a bit later. But here is what they came up with. They found that the force of gravity depended on two things. If you multiplied the two masses together and you divided by the square of the distance between them. We're going to use a radius because you'll see why in a bit. Now that gives you an answer, but that doesn't give you an answer in Newtons, unfortunately. And so we have to add a little conversion factor, a constant, a number to put in front. The same way, for example, as when you go from, well, let me think of a good example because you guys all grew up metric. Well, when you go from uh, meters to centimeters, you have to multiply the meters by 100, right? When you go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it's like double it and add 30 if you're traveling in the U.S. The constant is capital Big G, which is called the universal constant, the gravitational constant. The first mass in kilograms, the second mass in kilograms, how far apart the center of each mass is, squared, times this number. Now, this number is on your formula sheet. Don't get it confused with little g. Little g used 9.8. Big G is, it's also right here, 
6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And this was the tough number to find because is a times 10 to the negative 11 a very small number? That would be 0 0.000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
Matt, what's going to happen to that 2 when I take it out of the brackets? What's it really going to become? In fact, we get that. Joel, could you stand up, please? Could you roughly double the distance between you and Trevor? So step backwards, stop right there. It's four times weaker. Their force of attraction is four times weaker. Go back to where you were at the beginning. Could you roughly triple the distance between you and Trevor? You know how many times weaker it is now? Nine times weaker because that three is going to get squared. Go back to where you were. Could you roughly quadruple the distance between you and Trevor? How many times weaker is the force of attraction between you guys now? 16 times. 16 times. Joel, it's an inverse square relationship, we call it, okay? So, 4 times smaller, 9 times smaller, 16 times smaller. Uh, D, what if I leave the distance back to the original, but I double one of the masses? So for D, I would have this. Big G, one mass would stay the same, but I'd have a second mass doubled all over D squared. I think, Brett, I'll still end up with an M squared, yes? But you know what I have in front of everything? I think... A, a two, I think it's going to be twice as big. In fact, if we doubled Joe's mass, he would be twice as attractive. Trevor would find Joel twice as attractive if he was twice as fat. I don't know what that says about Trevor's mind, but still. okay. <laughs> Doubling the mass, Trevor, two times, but larger because the M's are on the top of the fraction. What if we double both of the masses? How many times bigger would their force of attraction be now? Four times bigger. Joel, stand up again, please. Okay, so starting right there, move your chair forwards, push it in. Half the distance between you and Trevor, so move closer to him. What would happen to the force of attraction between them now? How many times? It's going to be bigger. How many times bigger? Think square. Four times bigger. Four times bigger. Joel, go back to where you originally were. Okay. One third the distance. So divide it by three. Nine times bigger. Okay. This is how gravity works. Thanks, Joel. So if you half the distance, because when this number gets smaller, Andrew, when this number gets smaller, the overall answer gets bigger. Because this number is squared, the overall number gets bigger by the square of how many times smaller you made the number. It's called You're learning something called the inverse square law. This applies to anything that radiates out. So for example, right now, between me and Connor and John is sound. John, are you twice as far away from me as Connor is, roughly? I'm four times quieter compared to what Connor hears. Okay, And if I think Kara is about three times further away from me than Connor, you hear me nine times quieter than Connor does. It's the inverse square law. That's why when you go right up close to somebody, put your ear right by their mouth, you can hear them whisper so quietly because there you've really dramatically shortened the distance. It's probably several hundred times stronger because it's a square relationship. Hey, what if you double both the masses and the distance? Let's see that for G. Let's see. If I double one mass, if I double another mass, and I double the distance. What? Oh, you mean they cancel? Everything, yeah, everything cancels, doesn't it? I got a four on top. See it? And I'm going to get a 4 on the bottom when I pull the 4 out of the brackets. Uh, no change. Now, having said that, we're almost never going to be looking at masses 
of a human being type size. Gravity is usually minuscule, negligible. Oh, unless one of the masses is huge, for instance, a planet or a star or a moon. That's what we're going to be looking at, and that's why you probably want your formula sheet out, because we're looking at masses of the moon and the Earth and the sun, and you don't have to memorize them, but you want to look at them. So specifically, you want the back page of your formula sheet that has all the data on it. Okay? Example four. Assume the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, which it is. How do they figure that out? I'll show you. We'll actually calculate the mass of the Earth in just a few minutes because it's not like they could throw the Earth on a scale or anything. And it's not even like we could assume that the Earth was uniform all the way through and maybe measure uh, you know, 10 tons of dirt and multiply that by how much dirt there was because there's an iron core, which is a different density and a different weight. How do they figure out how heavy the Earth was? Fairly easy cross-multiplying question. But for now, I'm telling you, Andrew, it's 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, and its radius is 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. That's fairly easy to calculate just simply by watching a ship vanish over the horizon. If you know how high the ship's mass was, it's fairly simple trig to figure out what the curvature was and then just extend. It's the arc length formula for those of you in math 12, by the way. It's a very easy calculation. The arc length would be the entire circumference. Find the force the Earth exerts on a 50 kilogram person on its surface. This is Newton's law of gravity. What's big G? You might want to take a, check, a chance right now to find it on your formula sheet so you know where to look. Psst. There the data stuff. That's the page. Yeah, we're on the, you're on the back page that's photocopied two to a page with all the data on it, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff. And somewhere in there, I think you'll see a capital letter G. Yes? How big was big G? Okay. Every year, there's some kid who right now is completely out to lunch and starts putting 9.8s in there on the test, and I give them zero because... This is not little g, nine. this is big G, completely different. And I've tried to walk you through right now where it is on your sheet, but I also see there's two or three kids that didn't bother getting out their formula sheet, haven't bothered walking it through, fine, but you're taking a big risk. What's the big M, the mass of the Earth? Find where it is on your formula sheet, even though I gave it to you, you should be able to spot where it is. Do you see it? 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, yes. What's the little mass, the mass of the person? 50, the question says. Divided by the radius of the Earth squared. You might want to find where the radius of the Earth is on your formula sheet so you know where it is, even though I gave it to you in this question. 6.38 times 10 to the 6th squared. This is complicated enough with enough scientific notation I strongly encourage every one of you right now to try this on your calculator so that you know, for example, how to type in a scientific notation squared. See what you get. should get this, I think. I don't know if you get it bang on. I cheated and did a shortcut in my head. You get 490 bang on, or is it like 489.999 something? 489.95? Okay. So if you didn't get that, you want to start to figure out what you did on your calculator. Because for the next five days, this is the easiest calculator calculation. They're going to be longer and uglier. Okay. By the way, we could also have calculated this by going mg. What is 50 times 9.8? What is 50 times 9.8? 
See, we actually knew the force of gravity. We were able to do it. So why did we do it this long way? Well, as you move away from Earth, what happens to the force of gravity? It gets weaker. So what we're trying to develop is how the heck can we calculate what the force of gravity is, say, by the space shuttle, by the space station up in orbit? Also, well, this result should not be surprising since we, if we calculate the force of gravity using mg, then we get 490. This is going to give us something else neat. Until now, we've been aware of two ways to determine the gravity field. Now, the gravity field of the Earth is 9.8. And you can either call it meters per second squared, although it's also newtons per kilogram because it's an acceleration, and an acceleration is a force divided by a mass. Right? We found that, in fact, you found it in physics 11. You all put a weight near the ceiling, you dropped it, and you timed it. And although you got a lousy value for G in physics 11 because we're using crap equipment, you can imagine if we did it in a lab with electronic photo gates and instant timers, we can calculate that 9.8 really easy. This is not the neat thing, but the fact that we know this allows us to be fairly clever. So the gravity field at a point can be determined by measuring the weight of a small mass m, and the ratio of the weight, gravity divided by the mass, gives us g. Or we did it by calculating the acceleration and free fall last year. There's a third way. This means this. If this is gravity, and this is gravity, and these two m's are the same, that means that the equation for calculating this on Jupiter, where we can't go and drop something in free fall, or on Saturn, where we can't go and drop something in free fall, or on the moon before we went there, is, well, Emily, that M is the same as that M. That must mean the gravitational field is if you know the mass of the planet and you know the radius of the planet, you can calculate its gravitational field ahead of time without going there. That's how you can find, Connor, G on the moon or G on the sun. You can make it because you're looking really out of it. In fact, if I go like this, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times the mass of the Earth, oh, the decimal didn't go, Mr. Duick, divided by the radius of the Earth, squared, Mr. Duick, squared. Mr. Dewitt. Do I get 9.8? Okay. Now, we know the 9.8 ahead of time, yes? This is what allows us to go backwards and figure out what the mass of the Earth has to be in order to get the 9.8. This is how they figured out how much the Earth weighed. It was, oh, finally we know. The hard part was calculating this. So Cavendish did an experiment where he was actually able to measure something to the 11th decimal place. And one of the first things he did once he had that value accurate is he was, I can find out how much the Earth weighs now. Finally. Nice. So we call this the gravitational field. The gravitational field strength of a planet. Now this equation is not on your formula sheet. Is that? Well, it is on your formula sheet. Can you see it's tucked away in this? And that's what I've tried to show you. I guarantee you, on your test, on a question, multiple choice, I'm going to give you some mystery planet, planet Duick. I'll tell you its math and its mass and its radius, and I'll say, what's the gravitational field strength there? What I'm really saying is, can you go big G times the mass of the planet divided by the radius squared of the planet and tell me what it would be there? Okay. This last property is useful because it provides us with a means to calculate the mass of the Earth. Let's repeat what Cavendish did about 120 years ago, and let's see if we can get the same dumb smile that he did when he finally knew. He said, well, I know this. He said, 
get the m by itself? How would I get the mass of the Earth by itself? R squared goes on the top, right, Kara? And the big G goes on the bottom. He said, I guess it's going to be... The 9.8 had been measured for quite a while. Not that hard to measure the 9.8. You can figure it out in all sorts of ways. So he happily put that in. Radius of the Earth, you can measure, that's been measured actually for about 2,000 years pretty accurately. Another way you can measure it is looking at the shadow of the sun and comparing how that changes as the season. It's all sorts of ways to measure the curvature of the Earth. So they knew that it was 6.38 times 10 to the 6th squared. And then he smiled as he plugged in his just determined in the lab value for the universal constant of gravity. Try typing that in. How heavy is the Earth? You get something very close to 5.98. Sorry, 5. Point, what is it? 5. Point times 10 to 24. Right? And this is a mass, so kilograms. And he smiled. One of the next things he almost instantly did was he said, hey, now that I know this, now that I know this, and I know the force of gravity that the moon pulls on us from the tides, I can find the mass of the moon. I know the radius of the a distance. I know the distance between the Earth and the moon. Ah, it, 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 was, it was a bunch of dominoes fell into place. So gravitational field strength. This is how strong G is on anywhere. This also is going to let us calculate what G will be in orbit somewhere. Because gravity isn't zero in orbit, but it's smaller. How much smaller? Depends how far away you are from the Earth. We can figure it out. What's your homework? Number one. Number three. Number six, please notice they gave you the radius of the moon in kilometers. You'll have to change that to meters. This is what cabin, this is how you can find the mass of the moon. Seven. Eight, also in kilometers. Do I want to do nine? Yeah, I'm good. Eleven. And twelve. Okay. Please excuse this interruption.